Hi, I'm Steve Clemens, and I have a question. What happens if the U.S. government can't pay its debts? Let's get to the bottom line. Have you ever been in a situation where you've maxed out your credit cards and desperately need more money, but you've got nowhere to turn? Well, I hope not, but that's exactly where the U.S. government may be right now. America has hit the ceiling legally mandated by Congress on how much it can borrow. The limit was set last year at $31.4 trillion, but the government already burnt through that by January. Now the two parties are gearing for a showdown to negotiate a new temporary limit by June. The Republicans who control the House are using the opportunity to demand major cuts and rollbacks to President Joe Biden's agenda, especially those related to clean energy and food assistance to poor Americans. The White House says, no way. Just give us a new limit and then we'll talk. So who wins in this game of political brinksmanship? And is there really any limit to the runaway spending of the U.S. government? Today we're talking with Bobby Kogan, who worked in the Biden White House as an advisor to the Director of Office of Management and Budget. He's now the Senior Director of Federal Budget Policy at the Center for American Progress. And Gordon Gray, who served as a staff member for the Senate Budget Committee and is currently the Director of Fiscal Policy at the American Action Forum. Let me just start out and say I figure that one of you is a Democrat, one of you is a Republican. We're not going to tell the audience which yet. But, but let me just start for a second with you, Bobby, and ask... You know, why is this such a big deal, this debate about debt limit? Can't the United States government just print more money, print its way out of this problem, and, and deal with this? What are, what are the really the dynamics of this debate that many people are fearful could lead to the first serious default by the U.S. government? Sure. And, and for, uh, Steve, thank you so much for having me on. Um, so we are one of only two countries in the world with a fixed dollar debt limit. A handful of countries in the world also, you know, have debt limits of, of another kind, you know, set as a percent of the economy. But we're one of the only two in this way. And ultimately what it is is we, uh, hearkening back, um, well, hearkening back hundreds of years, we used to have to issue each, we, we uh, Congress used to have to approve each issuance of debt um, in a law, and we changed that to set a dollar limit. Now, every, every so often, depending on kind of how much we ra we've raised it and, and what our new deficits are, we have to keep increasing it again and again, lest we will default. Um, and this is really a question of whether it is we want to actually default in our debt, which I think, you know, we'll all agree here would be catastrophic if we didn't pay our bills. So you agree it would be catastrophic. And you work Center for American Progress. A lot of Democrats work at Center for American Progress. Do they take seriously debt um, and, and default? <laughs> uh, so I, I think there's I think there's a robust debate about the net effects of debt on uh, on the economy. Um, most people will say that all else being equal, um, more debt as a percent of the economy might kind of have some some sapping growths. Of course, and I can get to this later. All else is never equal. You have to figure out what it is mm. uh, you do to lower the debt and whether the net of, whether the effects of lowering the debt are worse or better than uh, the effects of what you did to lower it. But uh, I think most people agree that all else being equal, you'd want lower debt as a percent of GDP, especially during good times, um, and higher during bad times deliberately to kind of boost aggregate demand. Uh, the threat of default is, of course, really, really, really major. Uh, we might have had a technical glitch here or there before, but we've never deliberately default, defaulted in our debt, because why would we? Why would we deliberately say, I know we promised we'd pay you this money, but we won't? That would be catastrophic. No one would trust the U.S. government's word. Uh, it, would, it would send uh, interest rates skyrocketing. Uh, obviously, it would cripple the economy and, take, uh, uh, and destroy many jobs. And then in addition to that, we wouldn't make our payments. And that would hurt uh, all the people who rely on those payments, whether they're government contractors or Social Security recipients or disabled veterans or the people who's, uh, who we help put food on their table or, you know, you name it, the government does a lot of things. Gordon, I, we, we had a debt level, mandated debt level in 2002, of $6.4 trillion. Today, it's $31.4 trillion. How did that little number become so big? Well, a, a couple things there. Well, first of all, one of the, one of the challenges in, in, in using nominal numbers is that we allow, you know, decades of inflation just kind of uh, uh, send those up anyway. But unfortunately, over that last 20 years, we've had uh, global wars, a uh, you know, once in a hundred year pandemic, uh, we've had a, the Great Recession. Uh, we've had uh, somewhat uh, calamitous events confront this country. And we are privileged to live in a country that has the wherewithal to respond robustly. And it's actually interesting as we think about the current 
uh, debate right now, which is it used to be that Congress had to pass a law to issue a, basically a single issuance of debt. It was right. so rare. Uh. But obviously the federal budget uh, has changed substantially, and now the debt limit acts as a limit. It used to basically be uh, an allowance so that they didn't have to pass individual laws, but we've gotten somewhat uh, um, addicted to um, uh, deficit spending and, and the growth of indebtedness that that dynamic has flipped entirely. Why isn't there more discussion about a defense uh, budget that's, that's approaching a trillion dollars? That seems to be sac sacrosanct uh, for some reason, even in both parties. Uh, whereas you've got a debate on what kinds of cuts you have to put in place to either uh, uh, protect Social Security and Medicare, or you have some Republicans who actually want to cut uh, Social Security and Medicare in order to keep those trust funds solvent. So unpack it for us. Sure. Um, and, and so a part of the issue behind all of this is that over 70 percent of every non-interest dollar we spend goes directly to people. That's in the form of stuff like Medicare and Social Security and, and Medicaid and, and, and uh, SNAP. Uh, it's also in the form of, you know, kind of direct payments to help people afford their groceries or to, um, uh, um, or to yeah, help people afford their groceries or, or help with child care. So that, that's kind of over 70 percent. And the re remaining bit is, is sort of uh, its research, its investment in the future, its transportation infrastructure, and it's the military. Um, and so part of the issue behind all of this is that the government, what the government's doing is, is, is quite popular. And so figuring out what you would cut... Um, uh, first of all, it's probably unpopular to do it, and second of all, it might have del deleterious effects to do it because most of what we're doing is, is kind of directly helping people in the moment or investing in the future. As for what the, you know, what it is that, uh, why it is that the military um, budget is kind of largely untouched and the rest of it is kind of always on the chopping block, um, that's an issue of politics. Uh, the uh, military spending as a percent of GDP has declined significantly um, in the 20th century, but of course that there are two big reasons. So here. again, it's a big dollar amount. It's a big dollar it's... account, but it's, it's been declining. There are kind of two reasons there. One, you know, we used to be engaged in massive wars all the time, and now while we obviously are always engaged overseas, right. um, the full, you know, the full kind of breadth of the way we are is significantly down. And the second one is that the U.S. is significantly bigger than every other country. So if the U.S. spends um, 3% of its GDP, uh, I think it's a little bit more, but it spends 3-ish uh, percent of its GDP on the military, that is... Um, a lot more than another country. You see the stats of the U.S. spends more, you know, around as much as the next 10 countries combined. We're not spending m 10 times as much as percent of GDP. It's that we're a big country, and so right. we, you know, we can do a lot. Gordon, tell us where the state of play is right now. You know, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy has put out a plan. Yep. And the plan says, let's keep Social Security and Medicare solvent where they are. But he's saying to get the debt ceiling increase that we want, we've got to have cuts in other areas. The, the Democrats and President Biden has responded very, very strongly sure. against Leader McCarthy, Speaker McCarthy. How, you know, what's your take sure. on that state of play? I, I think the legislation that the Speaker put together is very much an opening bid. Essentially, the, the White House and congressional Democrats uh, pointed their fingers at Kevin McCarthy says, you know, put up or shut up. Now, um, this week is where the rubber meets the road. And he, it's now on him to find the votes for this proposal. Uh, I would just stop you there for Kevin sure. McCarthy to find the votes for his own proposal, right? Sure. Might he not have? He's the Speaker of the House. Mm -hmm. He's got a majority in the House. Might he not have the votes for his own proposal? It is, it is possible that he doesn't have the votes. His majority is sufficiently slim, and his majority is populated with, with a number of members who um, are not wildly inclined to support anything. Uh, that a leader puts out. Um, and one element of the debt limit, um, historically, is that there are always members, Republicans and Democrats, that are in transit on this issue. And they essentially say, I cannot vote for this, or I will not vote for this. Sometimes those are a little different. One is the, the cannot is, my, my constituency will, will eat me alive and I will not get reelected. Does anybody remember that President Joe Biden did not vote for a debt limit increase in 2002 when George no. W. Bush was president. Nor did and how do the, they explain that? The former, uh, the 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 last Democratic president, huh. President Obama, also voted against the debt limit under George W. Bush, and the rationale was rhetorically very similar to what um, intransigence on the other side say. So it's, it, all this, this high-handedness about you know the full faith and credit of the United States, you know, facing potential collapse. 
they risked that before. So does it undermine their credibility today, Bobby, when talking to Republicans and saying, don't put the U.S. government at risk? Yeah, I think you can absolutely uh, call hypocrisy on individual members. You see that all throughout. Um, at the end of the day, politicians are politicians, and um, they want to make the points they want to make. I think my frame would be, um, in terms of in terms of the bipartisanship of uh, of what you know, clean increases to the debt limit. Uh, we had seven clean ones under uh, under uh, President Bush, and those were all large, they were all very bipartisan. It's true you have plenty of Democratic members who did not vote for them, and you had some Republicans who didn't, but those were very bipartisan increases. Um, and there were three under President Trump, and those were also very bipartisan increases. Kevin McCarthy voted for all three of them. When we got to the Democratic presidents, all of a sudden they were a lot less bipartisan. I think that's that's kind of the point that I would make. It's true you can find individual members, you can call hypocrisy, right. you're not wrong to do it. But but the but there's a big difference here that when it comes to be a Democratic right. president, you get to see stuff where they say. I mean, Democrats didn't say, for instance, under President Trump. Um, we will only consider our opening bid is for you to, I don't know, do Medicare for all and raise the minimum wage. You know, they didn't say this is our opening bid. They, you know, they did a bipartisan increase. And I'm sure you had individual members who might have pushed. But I think there's, there's kind of a, a kind difference going on here. It doesn't take um, a, a, a well, uh, you know, an, an incisive political scientist to look at governance in the United mm -hmm. States as being divisive and fraught. Um, and... When you um, sort of roll that into a scenario where uh, if Congress cannot pass an increase in the debt limit, well, now you have a reason to fundamentally doubt that proposition that the Treasury is a riskless security. It forms the basis, the bedrock, the benchmark for global financial markets. Banks are capitalized in it. They underpin... So, Bobby, what happens to regular citizens out there? And yeah. what happened? I mean, like, what are, what, what are the... T you know, I hear this is going to be a tsunami of chaos. What is that? What's what's happening to regular people? So just to to, to the extent that that the treasuries are the uh, the bedrock of the financial system, every financial traction transaction that a uh, a private citizen is engaged in becomes costlier. Hmm. And so that is your mortgage, your auto loan, um, everything with an interest rate, everything that it interacts with the financial markets, and people will understand just how uh, interrelated all these are because everything in their life will become more expensive. On top of that, you will have disruptions to the federal government. And so that, um, that can involve, um, they will have to basically husband the cash that they have that they should be using mm. to pay other bills. And that can have consequences now for the broader macro economy. That can have consequences for employment. And so all of these are layered on top of an economic outlook where, you know, nobody's out there saying, oh, we're heading for boom times. People mm. are talking about the risk of recession. So we're uh, uh, adding this on top of, uh, I think, existing uh, anxiety about uh, about the economy for for every American and, and probably a lot of people around so the world. So it would yeah. suck. <laughs> yes, yeah, sir. It would be a terrible thing. <laughs> and I would just say yeah. to go on top of it. So Gordon did a great job of laying out like all the ways in which the financial sector starts to collapse if we default. Mm. In addition to that, the government is forced to um, immensely pull back on its spending. Right. So you're no longer allowed to run a net deficit. And if deficits, I don't actually have off the top of my head what the projected deficit this year is, but um, if it were to be a trillion dollars, then that would be a trillion dollars of less spending into the economy. And right. since, as I said, the hypermajority of what we do goes directly to individuals, uh, that means there's 70% less of that that's going directly to individuals. Um, and so that means everyone's paycheck uh, everyone's wallet is small, is lower. You can afford less food to put on the table. You can afford less child care. All the things that we do to make everything be interacted, but, uh, that's not happening. Your social security Bobby, checks are down. There's a book coming out in June that I've looked at um, called The Paradox of Debt by Richard Vague. And, and Vague makes the point that as debt has increased in the United States, uh, government debt, household savings has gone up. But he says what's very, very disconcerting is the inequality gap that those folks with assets tend to ga you know, gather much more assets. And, and as that debt rises, the federal government debt, the, the private gains of the most wealthy in society are there. So I'd just be interested in that, that side because Joe Biden has come out and said part of this is we need to pump up the IRS and we need to tax the rich more and deal with these social contract stresses. Is there any resonance for that within regard of talking about the debt ceiling politics? And, and is, this, is, there, is there any room for that to run? Yeah, I, I, that's actually a great point. I looked at this uh, in 2019 when I was working at the Senate Budget Committee. And um, 
uh, the net assets of the United, uh, uh, of the nation um, are significantly up, even netting out uh, the debt that the government holds. Right. So the assets net of the government, uh, the government's debt are going up and up and up and up and up. Uh, I think they're up to 130, 637 trillion as of the last. But wouldn't it argue that yeah. like increasing debt's a good thing? Well, so whether or not it's a good thing, what's very clear is that the line that you hear. Um, that we are leaving the next generation worse and worse off. That's that's just not true. People are getting richer and richer and richer mm -hmm. on a real per capita basis. The issue, as you said, is that where that uh, where the accumulation of wealth um, is uh, is is really bad. You have some people who are uh, doing extremely well, and you have a lot of people who are falling behind. Mm -hmm. And that's you know that's where we really ought to be focused. And I guess that would be my ret my retort to the idea of mm -hmm. uh, that we, we can't possibly afford to raise our debt limit because you know, we're over leveraged, we're not. Gordon? Uh, so I, I would not be someone who would argue that we can't afford to raise a debt limit. Rather, I would, I would uh, uh, argue that we have to raise a debt limit, and when we are going to consider doing so, we should also consider the budgetary context in which we're doing it. Now, uh, the proposal that uh, the Speaker McCarthy put forward, um, I, I don't think anyone's under any illusion that that piece of legislation is going to be signed into law. I don't think that the Senate's going to pass it. I don't think that the President of the United States right now is, is uh, you know, breaking out his pen to sign it into law either. Um, and so to the extent that there, a, a negotiation ensues and, and we increase the debt limit and there's um, a negotiated um, a budgetary component to that, it's going to be fairly small ball. Um, right. You know, we're going to run... Uh, Twenty trillion dollars in deficits over the next uh, next ten years. We're going to spend eighty billion dollars, and the high, you know, the the, the legislation. Billion Kevin, or trillion? Trillion. trillion. Excuse me. Billion, yeah. <laughs> um, billion here, a billion there. Okay. Um, but the legislation that Kevin McCarthy put forward may reduce spending by four and a half trillion over the next ten but years. Let me ask you a question: Why do they go after climate change and food stamps and say military well, spending is great? It's it's really not just about fiscal. Uh, conservatism. If you are saying okay, and so, so I, I'm just sort of interested in, in the in the you know the targets they're going after sure. in this debate. And, and uh, the reason, what, what, what I, uh, basically, uh, they have each Republicans and Democrats, particularly over the last six years, uh, have all agreed that the most significant parts of the federal budget, so that is mm -hmm. the major entitlement programs and the tax code, are off limits. And once you've walled off all but 10 to 20 percent of the federal budget, then no matter what, when you are only negotiating on a small sliver of the federal budget, you're not touching any element of the real mm. budgetary risk that we're facing. So I actually think in this uh, uh, debate that we're seeing here is that there's a lot of risk that we care that we you know already talked about about not increasing the debt limit, and I think the upside budgetarily is fairly small. Um, and so uh, I, I do think it is a worthwhile uh, to have this conversation, recognize where uh, in this current environment is. There's some compromise on, on the budget, but also recognize mm -hmm. that we're still have a lot of work to go. And this probably is not the debate where we're going to tackle the budget problem. Is it crazy to have this debate at all? I mean, when you kind of look at the fact that they're only going to, if, if they succeed and they go with Kevin McCarthy or the Joe Biden plan, we're talking about a one and a half trillion dollar increase to this 31.4. So that would get us up you know, about a one and a half trillion more leeway uh, in, in the government debt that can be carried. Um, what does it buy them? Is this just, just to sure another nightmarish, uh, you know, yeah, one, gladiatorial contest in this right before the election? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> if, uh, um, one quick response, and I wanted to get to something else. You actually, uh, he said 1.5 trillion or March 2024, right. right, whichever comes first. So that is showing that even if, even if it got him longer, then we still want to set it up to have a you know a fight right before. The, but you know, getting to your first point, should you know what about this in the first place? What I would say is, I think that the debt limit should be completely separate from uh, you know whether we default is right. just a separate question from what our fiscal path should be. I, I mentioned in the beginning that most countries don't do it the way that we do, and that's because they know that if you want to change your deficits and if you want to change your debt. You change your spending and tax laws. Right. You don't say, well, we should think about this or else we'll default. Right. Like that's not that's not an OK position. So Congress can and should debate its fiscal path, but they 
shouldn't do it with the pretext of if this doesn't work out right, then we might default in our obligations. Like that's not an, an appropriate way to do it. And, so, and I would just say we also do have a debate about fiscal policy every single year, right? Uh, Speaker McCarthy focused mo the hyper majority of what he was focused on. It was like on. blackmail. You know, kind of. You know. <laughs> Your word's not mine. Um, <laughs> but, but, it, but it raises the interesting, and also the deal that Kevin McCarthy did to be in government. You, you actually have statements of some of the GOP members that supported Kevin McCarthy, that were holdouts and then came on board. They've been out saying, we want to wreck the, the federal government budget process. We want to wreck, we want to see uh, government fail. Um, and that, so I just want to have people know that while that may not be the bulk of views, it certainly become part of the equation. You disagree? Uh, I, I think I, I would I would just want to uh, at least note that at the end of the day, to increase the debt limit, you need to have a bill pass mm -hmm. the House and the Senate, and the president has to sign it. Right now, there simply aren't the votes for a clean debt limit. There aren't the votes for it in the Senate, and there aren't the votes for it in the House. Right. Now, I understand why that would be frustrating and inconvenient, um, but individual elected right. <laughs> legislators have to be the ones who take this vote. And right now, a clean debt limit does not have enough votes to pass the House and the Senate. And so real make quick, it to a, your a gut answer, ceremony. your prediction, are they going to pass this, your view? I, I think they will increase the debt limit. I think they will increase it. I don't think they're going to pass the, the speaker's legislation. So you're uh, an optimist that a deal will get done? A little Bob, bit. <laughs> Bobby, are you an optimist or a pessimist? Uh, I'm bad at these predictions. I, I, think, I think the risk of default is the highest it's been in... in, in uh, in U.S. history. I agree with that. Um, I Internally, I was around 50-50, which is a coward's, uh, a coward's number, right? An economist. Yeah, <laughs> right. 33-33. Uh, I'm 30, similarly 30, 30. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, you know, whether you're at 25, 50, um, as Gordon said, a lot, if you take people at their face, uh, at what they've said, their statements at face value, then there aren't the votes. We might find that when we're really close to it, we could have like a tarp right. style situation where we're right there and then we, we find that there are the votes. Um, but the, o I would say the only reason that there might not be the votes is that some people have decided um, that debt is inappropriate now that Biden is president um, when it was appropriate before. Again, there was huge bipartisan um, support. Yeah, to Republicans have spent a big chunk of that debt well, up. And, yeah. and to go to this, Got I put out a report right. a month ago that said um, the level, it's not right. about the level of debt, it's about the trajectory of debt, but it just said if you, if you hadn't done the Bush tax mm. cuts, their bipartisan extensions and the Trump right. tax cuts, then debt would be declining forever as a percent of GDP. Fascinating conversation. I wish we had more time, which I rarely say in a talk about debt and uh, debt limits. Uh, Bobby Kogan, Senior Director of Federal Budget Policy at the Center for American Progress, and Gordon Gray, Director of Fiscal Policy at the American Action Forum. Thank you so much for a great conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Nice so what's the bottom line? Here's the paradox. Growing the national debt can actually help grow the economy, and it can increase the private sector's wealth, even as the government's debt burden gets heavier. But too much debt can drive up inflation, it can make the dollar lose value, and it can undermine confidence in the future. No one has a magic wand and knows how to balance America's budget, no matter what the country's leaders say. So yes, America will keep printing money. As for the politicians, though, the debate on the debt ceiling is going to go to the brink. I think we're probably going to be okay. Still, there's always a chance that someone may misstep, misjudge, or misfire. And then things can go downhill really, really fast. And that's the bottom line.